morning to you all. Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers past and present. As you can uh, well notice, uh, we're not at church today. We're having church. You're joining in with us. Uh, but I'm live streaming from home and uh, just didn't really feel like going out this morning in the wind and the cold. Uh, I may have told you this joke before a long time ago, whatever, but there was this this young fella and he was sleeping in on a Sunday morning and his mother came in and told him, she said, you know, Johnny, you got to get up. You got to go to church. And well, I don't want to go to church today. She says, Johnny, quit your whining, get up and go to church. You're the pastor. You have to go. So here I am. Oh, wait a minute. I hear somebody. Oh, there's somebody coming. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, Zelda. This is Zelda here. I just thought I'd wish everybody here a happy, hang on for a second. Oh, do you like my mask? I had this specially made by a wonderful person, Wendy. Thank you, Aunt Wendy. Beautiful, isn't it? Thank you. Uh, hang on. <coughs> <coughs> We're social distancing enough. That's quite enough. Yes, yeah. okay. Well, I'm just here to wish everyone a happy Mom's Day, like I said. And all those people that have a mom's spirit, I wish you a mother, happy Mother's Day, too. Um, and I have a note from Nikki, and she wants to say hello, and that she misses her, her friend kids, uh, Cash, Betsy, Sadie, Brody, Harper, the big ones, Mackenzie and Emma, nice dogs, yeah, um, Chloe and Claire. So we all miss you, and we hope to see you soon. And oh, hang on for just a second, one moment. <laughs> Thank you. That's for Nikki. Sorry, but the first got it last night. Anyway, I'm out of here, folks. Take care. Happy Mother's Day. Well, you never know who's going to show up for church. Let me share an opening scripture with you, and then, uh, then we'll have a short prayer. In Ephesians 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul writes to us, um, as well as the church in Ephesus, he says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that anyone can boast. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the day that you've given us and bringing us together the, this morning for the message. May you bless the message that you have for us. Speak it into our hearts and souls. Add your continued blessing upon the scriptures we read and share. And by your spirit, open our hearts to your truth. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I have noticed over the years, and I've noticed it more so uh, on Facebook since I joined earlier this year with, with many a post that, that people are saying how they tend to take their moms for granted a, a lot of the time. Comments, something like, you don't know how much your mom means to you, so you don't have her anymore. So missing out on a mother's love, you know, you know exactly when it's not there. I don't know about you, whether you're a believer in God or not, but I still struggle with the fact that times that, that God loves me. And as a believer, this might sound strange. And maybe this kind of struggle keeps those of you who haven't trusted God yet. Maybe this thinking that God could not possibly love you because, and you fill in the blank, you know, the sins in life. Does this keep you from trusting and believing in God in the first place? I know God loves me, but I often get reminded of how I treat God, you know, my sinfulness and all. And that he loves me so much, yet I don't treat him as he truly deserves. That's what makes me question his love for me. How could anyone take that? Sometimes when we're thinking and feeling like this, I think about moms. For the most part, moms are the best. And if we try and fathom God's love for us, most moms are the best. And if we want to try and fathom God's love for us, maybe the closest thing to it, the closest thing we can find here on earth is the love moms have for their children. How they sacrifice so much and are always ready to forgive their children for all the mistakes that they make. And no matter what, most loving moms will be there through thick and thin for us, their children. 
the passage that I shared from Ephesians 2, the Apostle Paul had written that it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. That's trust, remember. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift from God. It's not by works, not the things that we do so that no one could boast. God loves us far deeper than we can comprehend. So much that God came to earth in the form of flesh, and that's Jesus Christ. And he made himself a, a sacrifice for our sins. God had fulfilled his own holy and righteous requirements that we could not do on our own. So if we rewind a bit, God's love was so immense for us, even though he's most holy and we're sinners, all of us, he in his great love made the decision to extend his love, his grace, his forgiveness to us, despite our sins and our failures. That reminds me of mums. Grace might be a term that we're likely to think of when we give thanks for our food. But grace, let me remind you, is, is defined as unmerited favor, undeserved goodness that's extended to someone else. And by our placing our trust and our faith in God, we can then he can extend his grace, his favor, and his love to us that far exceeds our sins and our failures. Now, the issue of our sins, our mistakes, and our failures, we need to be honest with ourselves and God. And you might think that you're not such a bad person. I don't kill people. I don't cheat people. I don't do this and that and the other things that seems to make it to the top of the, the sinful list. But let me ask. Do we put God first in our lives, even us as believers? It's likely no. So this breaks the first commandment. In putting God second, third, or, uh, or on the last of the list in priorities, we then have created other gods that take place of the one true living God. A couple of prime examples is money and possessions, and there's lots of other examples. Some of these things on their own are not bad, but when they become between us and God, they, they become sin. Do we tend to allow others to suffer while we have the means to help? Do we lie? Do we cheat? Do we steal or withhold from others so that we have more to use to get what we want? All this kind of living is rooted in sin. So no matter how good you might think you are, or how good I might think I am, or if we reject God now and think, well, if there is a God that in the end, because I'm not such a bad person, he'll be nice to me. He'll understand, even though I've never really given God the time of day. This line of thinking is dangerous. This kind of living will have uh, disastrous and eternal consequences of separating anyone that thinks like that from all that's good. I don't say all this stuff to beat up on you or myself. I say it because we all need to see our sinful condition and thus recognize the need that we have for forgiveness of these sins. And we can have forgiveness of sins because God loves us. Just like we've been forgiven so many times by others who love us. But this is human love and forgiveness and is given to us by fellow sinners. But how much more is God capable of forgiving us because he loves us so much more immensely and more deeply? King David of the Old Testament, he had quite a life, all right. Even while he was just a boy, a kid, he ended up approaching and, and defeating a, a, a giant, Goliath. He was the enemy uh, taunting Israel. God lifted up David, and he loved David, and seen David through wars and troubles like no other. David loved God, too. But as any human could or would, David sinned, and at times, in big ways. Listen to what David writes as a song or a prayer to God. It's found in Psalm 51. I'm reading 13 verses. He prays, blot out my sins. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my sins and my sins is always before me. Against you, only you, have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face 
from my sins and blot out all of my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit. I grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. David had come to the truth, the truth of the matter. He was utterly sinful. And he prayed to God, understanding God's immense love and forgiveness. He asked God to erase, to blot out all of his sin, the sin that was ever before him. Meaning, David could see in every, every aspect of his life that there was sin in his daily life. God, like the loving parent that he is, he forgives those who will seek him. The whole nation of Israel was the recipients of God's love and his protection. But when life got good and much easier, they soon forgot God and turned away from God. Time after time, God forgave them. Even after God allowed them to be punished, God would always love and be willing to forgive his people if they would turn back to him. We're falling away from God in our own little world, are we not? God wants to love us and he wants to forgive us. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 22, the prophet writes of God, I have swept away your sin like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. We tend to only think of love and forgiveness in the human ways or in the human strength and will. We know full well that sometimes we don't always love. We don't always seem ready to forgive. But this is not God's way of loving. If God's love for us was as weak as our love is for others, we'd all be in big trouble. God doesn't want to send judgment upon the world or upon you and I as individuals. But judgment is necessary to deal with sin and our mistakes. God has taken upon himself the penalty that was due to all of us for our sins, the sacrifice of Jesus, God in the flesh. And why? Because he loves us that much. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 31 to 39, he says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall, who shall separate us? from the love of Christ. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. There is nothing in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God. Paul continues, he says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. These verses, they apply to God's children, the ones who have accepted God and, and trust in his word. Those who reject God, well, it's the rejection of, of God that in the end will have these people facing eternal judgment. And I can hear it now. Oh, Mark, I'm not such a bad person. You know, those kinds of comments. Our sin, consider this. We can't judge ourselves by our own standards, but only by someone or something else that's better than us, the best of the best. We can't find that on earth, but of heaven. This is God. Humanity can't work its way to God. Humanity can't save itself. The more we try, the worse it seems to get. All the rules and the different things that, that we replace God with can't save us from judgment. And this is not about religion at all, but it all boils down to love. All the religions have us as humans working to get to God, except in the Christian faith. It's the only 
religion, if you want to call it that, the only way we find God of any culture actually reaching out to us to love us and to help us and to guide us like any perfect mom or dad would do. That kind of love to the utmost degree deeper. There is only but one judge holy enough, and that is God. How far in the future is yours or my judgment? It's not that far away. In fact, it's only a, a single heartbeat away. Because today is the day of salvation, to make the decision to trust God in his word. Tomorrow might be too late. This afternoon, this evening might be too late. God doesn't want to send anyone hardship. His first and his main focus upon us is his love. God does allow trouble so that we realize we need him. God gave us a commandment so we would recognize our sin and thus see our need for forgiveness. And as a loving parent, he loves us so that to the point where we can't even fathom, only to know God came to earth in the flesh as Jesus and took the penalty of our sins. He was actually placing the judgment upon himself. He wants us to return to him, to seek him. One, for those who, who don't believe, God wants you to, be, uh, you to become his children. At the moment, humans without God are part of his creation, of course, but not classed as his children. But as we become believers, as we trust God and seek his will in our lives, and we accept his sacrifice through Christ, we become his children, his dearly beloved children. We are then loved by God far beyond what our loving mothers and fathers could ever do. And second, God wants believers, those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, he wants us to make a return to him as well. Each and every one of us as believers, yet somehow or another, we have left Christ by the wayside in exchange for some of the stuff or all of the stuff that the world offers. We too have a returning to do. We too are allowed to go through some troubles and hardships so that we'll be reminded that we need God and we need his love. Most of us have had the experience of a, a loving mother offering us grace. Remember, that's undeserved favor and offering us forgiveness. And we can fathom these experiences. And when we think of God and how he loves us despite how we sin and we fail, that doesn't change the fact that he loves us. He loves us all as his creator, but he wants us to become his children, that he may extend his unmerited favor, his grace upon us to forgive us of our sins. God wants us to recognize him as holy, almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God. He also needs us to recognize our own sinfulness and, and our need of forgiveness. And then his loving forgiveness can be given to us. We can receive salvation. And if you have trouble thinking or believing that God loves you, then hopefully you've been the recipient of a mother's love. Then you can comprehend how may you have disappointed her from time to time in the past, but she loved you anyway, forgave you each time for each failure, extended her love and her grace to you. And if you can fathom that, then you're on the right road. You're on the right track to knowing or understanding how God loves you. He created you. He loves you and wants to be your heavenly parent, if you like. May God bless our moms of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Thanking you, God, for their love for us and your love for them and your deep and everlasting love for us, too. I know that some people uh, can't truthfully say that they had loving moms. Maybe you don't feel that you can use your mom or your dad or someone else as an example of love shown to you. And it is possible that some of you may think or feel that no one has loved you. And even if that was true, God loves you with the deepest, perfect, and most holy love possible. And he's shown this to you. And he's shown it to me through Jesus Christ. Earthly love can fail us. But like the Apostle Paul said, nothing can separate us from the love of God through Jesus. So if you feel that love is missing in your life, I ask that you seek the source of love. And that's the God who created you. If you haven't accepted Jesus as Savior for the forgiveness of your sins, what's holding you back? Can you admit that you've sinned? That's step one. Step two would be asking God to, to help you simply trust him 
and his word and ask him into your life because you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. Let's take a moment and pray about some things that are on our hearts and minds. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, our Creator, we thank you, Lord God, that uh, you have created each and every one of us, that you have redeemed us, you have brought us back into right relationship with you through Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who has guide us, uh, guided us to the truth. Lord, for, for those who may be listening, who haven't accepted you, Lord, we, we pray, and I pray, that each one would, would begin to trust you. Maybe making a simple prayer of God, I want to believe that you're there. I want to, to believe and to know that I am loved. I can recognize that there is sin in my life. And I would like to have these sins forgiven. So, Lord, for the first time, I trust you, Jesus. I trust in your sacrifice for the forgiveness of my sins. And Heavenly Father, we do pray for the forgiveness of our sins. Our sins, as David said, are, are always before us. You know that we are but flesh. We are but dirt and water. And that our spirits are prone to sin. But we thank you, Lord, that you have provided forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings, for the food that you give us to eat, for the people who work to and serve to help sustain our daily lives, those in health care and emergency services, those who work in the grocery stores, and all those people who supply and, and make sure that we get the things that we need. We thank you for all of them. We praise you, Lord God, for loving moms. We pray, Lord, for all those who have lost their moms to time. We pray, Lord, that you would remind each one of us of the love that we had from our moms and that their spirits are still with us. Lord, we pray for those who are, are mourning loss of loved ones, maybe through accidents or acts of violence or wars or those who have lived out their years to, to, uh, to finally head home to rest. We pray, Lord, that you would be with, with all these people around the world in our community to grant them comfort and peace. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus who has taught us to pray. And let's, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May God bless you and your families, and may he guide and protect you and lead you in ways that are truly pleasing to him. Have a blessed day, and don't forget, you need to wash your hands. <laughs>